So welcome. Today what we're going to be talking about is John Corbino's paper titled, We Shouldn't Even Be Discussing Having This Discussion, right? And so what discussion is he talking about? Well, let's start with the beginning of the paper. How does uh, Corbino start this paper? Well, he starts it in a very interesting way. What he does is he actually starts it on a very personal note which is maybe not the normal thing to do right in a very academic sort of paper. How does he do that? Well, he starts with a description of Mark, who's his partner, and their daily routine, what they do when they get up and everything like that. So why is this important? Why would he start it that way? Well, why is the morning different? There's something important about that particular morning waking up and going to work with you. In particular, what he's going to do is he's on his way to a conference and he want, and he's going to debate on the issue of same-sex marriage. So he is uh, in a same-sex relationship with his partner, Mark, and he's going to debate Glenn Stanton. And Glenn Stanton is a representative of an organization called Focus on the Family. And obviously, you can refer, and of course, if hopefully you have read the paper as well, that Glenn is not a supporter of same sex marriage, quite the opposite. So, John Corvino is going to go, he's going to debate on this particular issue. But it's interesting to know, what is Glenn and John's relationship like between each other? They're, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously opposed to each other's view on same-sex marriage, but what is their personal relationship like? Now, I thought this was interesting in the paper. It's actually very cordial. They're, they're very friendly. They talk on a regular basis, they willing to remember important dates and, and events in each other's life. And so that surprised me. You would think they would be at each other or they would personally hate each other. But they're actually very friendly with each other, but they strongly disagree on this issue. Now, that might be an issue then, is that, well, same-sex marriage is just an issue regarding social policy or the law, right? It's a very academic sort of debate. Maybe you can say it's simply that. They're just having this sort of academic uh, professional debate, and it's not really, you know, taking the emotions into it. But that's not the case, because... For at least for for you know, it is a very personal issue as well. It's not just an academic exercise in debating a topic, but it's something that's meaningful to him and his life. And so they have this debate at this university, and it's funny also they they have they travel so much and have these type of debates. We're not even sure which university they're they're at at the moment. <laughs> they have to kind of check with each other to see, you know, where they're debating. And then who is the audience? And then I thought this was interesting. So if you remember from the paper, the audience includes the general public where, you know, one individual person, a lady had started to share her spouse, her own particular view on the issue, and kind of go off on a rant in a way that kind of derailed the debate between Glenn and John. And it was kind of hard to, to communicate then and, and speak to this person because their mind was already, sounded as if it was already uh, made up. They, already decided where they stand and they didn't need to hear any debate about it. Like, why are we having this debate? 
it's so obvious what the answer is. So what's the point of arguing then? Well, this is where Corvino points out why does he go through this? Why, even despite what people maybe already made up their minds about it, they don't want to hear competing sides, why does he continue to publicly go out there and try to construct meaningful debates for a public audience? Some would say, well, maybe this is just a private issue, right? Then like, oh, this is just to each their own. Let the person decide what they're okay with. Um, this is not something we should be debating about, you know, publicly. It is up to an individual. But he agrees on that as well. Because then it can't just be simply a private matter. Because what is decided in the law and policy affects him regardless, right? So this is something that isn't really just simply left to the general population to decide. So we have to think then, even if it was a private matter and saying, well, I don't agree with it, I think it's wrong, then you're making a moral distinction. This is where the ethics comes in. You're making an evaluation a value judgment of what is right and what is wrong. And this is where the law and morality kind of intersect here. Because where do we gather the law? How do we make policies? How do we decide what is right and what is wrong in society? What the rules are? We have to do some ethics initially. Lawmakers, politicians, they engage intimately with ethics for the good or for the bad. Actually, that's another ethical judgment, right? Are they good at, you know, formulating clear reason, moral reasons, right? Why there should be a law for or against something. So the problem here is that When you say we ought not judge one another, this is where Car Carvino also kind of puts out, well, you know, some people will say, let's just not even get involved with this. Why, you know, let's not make any judgments at all. Like, let's say we don't even have to make it a law. Let's just not discuss it. That's also an issue for Car Carvino because in a sense, he has a couple of problems. But you're, you're sidestepping controversy. So well, when people say something like, let's agree to disagree, notice it's a way to kind of alleviate any tension, but it also doesn't solve anything. Because then you're also just basically turning the blind eye. You're ignoring the problem. The problem is still there. Even if you agree to disagree, there was no resolution. So why? He points out that we ought not judge one another is largely mistaken. And, and he points actually at his liberal friends, saying, even though they're having well intentions, they, they mean well in saying that, it's not really helping him in his life and with the issue of his relationship. Because it's logically itself a truth. What does he mean by that? So if you read the statement, we ought not judge one another. Isn't that a judgment? So isn't it kind of contradictory to say do I not judge one another by making a judgment? So that doesn't seem to be really helpful. We can't just simply say, well, we shouldn't judge. Well, you're already in the game of judgment. The second issue points out is that it's rhetorically misguided. And this is what he would say to his liberal friend. They maybe want to support his same sex relationship and that he recognized legally is that it seemed to be the case if you say, well, it's not just, it's being judgments or whatever, you kind of hand over the whole debate to the other side. Say, well, okay, well, the other side will decide because no, 
the opposing side is going to make their own judgments regardless if you want to engage or not. So, you know, not getting into the debate, not saying, well, we shouldn't judge at all. I don't want to get into it. Doesn't really help anybody. Doesn't help him. Saying, if you don't get into this debate, if you kind of say, well, everybody to each their own, it doesn't help him at the end of the day. So the opposing conservative side will still be against his way of life. And his friends not speaking up doesn't really solve or support his his life or his or the issues, right, that he's dealing with. So the third is he wants to point out as well, people have a moral responsibility to promote standards of right conduct. That you can't simply get out of messy situations or complicated issues by saying, well, to each their own, I don't want to get involved. The issues are still there. So running away from the problem is not, you know, the morally responsible thing to do. Avoiding the problem, pretending you don't see the issues uh, isn't the right way to live, in a sense, of what he's pointing out. So this is why morally sitting on a private matter, it's not something that, you know, he believes that, well, we can just each decide our own view of right and wrong. Because it largely affects his life and everybody else's life around him. It affects all our lives. We live, we don't live in a bubble. We don't live on a deserted island where we can just you know, make our decision and it doesn't affect anybody else but ourselves. Our decisions affect a lot of different people, whether we observe it or not. So this is where he gets into aims, biases, and burdens. And how we have these moral discussions. How do we have these moral debates that are very controversial and touchy to people? You know, they trigger people. How do we get into these debates? But if we have a moral responsibility to, to not ignore serious important issues. So he wants to point out that good arguments are formulated to persuade people, right? And he's a philosopher as well. He points that out that he's not just somebody who's in a same sex relationship, but he's also a philosopher. So he's thinking, what are the reasons? You know, how do I back up my position? What evidence can I provide? How do I persuade people to see the truth of them? Well, there's some extreme responses that he's coming to in his effort to kind of, for people to recognize good reasons why uh, his relationship is a valid relationship. Some people may argue that, well, only gay people can speak with authority on homosexuality. He disagrees with that. Why? Because and you can come up with good arguments and not necessarily have to be long to the group that the argument is about or relevant. Now, he also says, he admits that any good discussion, any good, you know, debate about an issue should include people representative of that. Right. So if we were talking about issues like Black Lives Matter, that discussion should have black individuals as part of the conversation. But does that mean you have to be black in order to have a good argument of why black lives matter? No, not necessarily. And I think this is what he's pointing out as well with homosexuality and same sex. There couldn't be really good arguments by an individual who doesn't identify as a homosexual, that supports same-sex relationships or marriages, right? Now, the other extreme he's coming to is, well, aren't gays bi? So if you ask and invite homosexual people to debate about the issue, wouldn't they just be biased if they already decided? Said, well, there might be some prejudice. There might be some initial bias. He acknowledges that. However, 
again, if you were to say, well, no one can really debate if they have any sort of bias, you know, or belong to any particular group, then it's really not possible to debate anything, almost. He does bring up the example of, you know, abortion or, or reproductive rights for women. Say, so, well, women can't talk. Well, if we kind of take this line of reasoning that he's pointing out is mistaken, then you, you can claim that, well, women are going to be biased because they can't really discuss things that, in a fair, objective way, that, that influence them. But then on the other side, then you couldn't say men could discuss it either because then they could have biases as well. Or they're not, like reverting to back to the first issue, they're not part, they're not women, they don't have to deal with this. So they shouldn't be in the discussion. And you see how kind of foolish the whole thing is, is that then no one can discuss anything and no one can have any peace being put about any matters. And again, I think this is his main point. Nothing gets resolved if we kind of take these extremes. No real resolutions, answers come from us kind of just backing out and saying it's too controversial, you know, it's too complicated. Now, there's also a third view that he discusses. And this is why I kind of touched on a bit uh, in previous right now. We shouldn't discuss this type of stuff at all if the answer is so obvious. Saying, well, obviously, the, you know, same sex individuals should be able to marry. It's so clear. And that kind of refers back to the individual at the debate. You know, people in the crowd just outspoken about it. The answer is so obvious. We shouldn't even be discussing this. But there's a problem with this view, and I, I've already kind of alluded to that, is that if you take that stance, we still, at the end of the day, we live in a world where others do some issues affect each other. And this is why he said these moral issues are also legal issues, and they, and they're important. They're not just individual preferences. Like, I like the that this way, or I don't like go this way, because these judgments affect his life directly, right? It, the politician for, let's say, the state he lives in disagrees with same-sex marriage, hypothetically, then, you know, it's not just the politician that's, you know, in charge, personal opinion, Whatever laws they formulate are going to affect his life living in that state. So he also wants to touch on the misuse of burden of proof. That, well, some people might say, you know, the burden of proof is on the other side. They have to prove to me why it's wrong, or they have to prove to me why it's right. And he's going to point out that that's not really helpful either. So a person who says, well, the answer is so obvious. You proved to me why it's wrong. Taking that approach isn't helpful because there's no way to be let off the hook, so to speak, on either side. Both sides have to engage and really consider the opposing views and the reasons behind it. This is why it's serious engagement. So whatever side you're on on the debate, if you're whatever political affiliation, if you're conservative, liberal, whatever, to kind of just stick on your side and say, well, I don't need to listen to the other side, or they have to do all the work, doesn't, it's not really working on an engaged responsible level. He points out, as I said before, you are responsible to engage in these. You can't just leave it to other people to judge. So what is his argument? 
how is he going to persuade us, right? So in talking about the case for same-sex relationships, he wants to show us that what are the reasons? He's also, like he said, a philosopher. He wants to have clear reasons, not simply because, well, he's homosexual, so that's it. That alone is not a reason. He wants to give, provide clear reasons as well. And be persuasive, because again, how is he going to live and work with people who disagree with him? He has to engage with them. We all have to engage with each other, even if we don't see eye to eye. So how do we maybe get others to kind of see or try to understand, you know, our point of view and the reasons that back this up? So some will say, well, the obvious answer is, is that it just makes people happy. It's just the individuals in this part would just be happy. And that's enough reason. But he kind of disagrees with that. <laughs> because if that's all it's about, just happiness, then you have to also admit, too, that some relationships don't provide happiness, whether it's same sex marriage or same sex or not. Some relationships don't provide happiness at all. Right? It actually becomes maybe hurtful or damaging. So reducing the issue to just making people happy is not really giving good foundation and reasons why. So it's too simplistic. So why are relationships a value according to him? So what makes a relationship valuable if it's just not happiness? For him, relationships are more meaningful than that. To have a relationship is to have a situation where you have, that allows you to have growth in yourself, to have fulfillment, and this is what I say, you know, not all relationships are to provide that. Some relationships are not good relationships, right? So for him, a relationship is something that is helping you flourish and grow as an individual. But then this is why he's a good philosopher. He's also going to entertain in this particular paper the other side. What would the other side say, right? So again, he's not showing a bias of like, well, my side just makes sense and we're not going to even discuss it. So, like, okay, let's, let's take the other side's uh, view. Well, for him, he says his conservative critics might argue that he's equivocating the term relationship. What he's calling a relationship is not a relationship. This is the way they define a relationship. And he's seen this sort of tactic a lot that, you know, what it means to be in a relationship has to fit a particular definition. And being of the same sex is not considered a serious romantic relationship to people who, his critics, who argue against him. So what is his response to something like that? that, well, then that kind of thumbs down what a relationship is and kind of, sort of like robs the relationship of, of its value, of its meaning. Because if what's if from the other side, if they're saying what matters is that the person is of the same sex or not, and that determines what the relationship a serious marriage is or relationships, then the things that he talked about, having a meaningful growth and fulfillment, uh, those are important. All that's really important, according to this definition from his critics, is that the sex of the individual. And see how that kind of robs the, the value of a marriage or definition of a marriage or a relationship is that you just boil it down to whether the 
person is of the same sex or not, and whether they can have sexual intercourse or not that, that produces offspring or something, right? So that's really kind of a cheap definition of a marriage or a relationship. But he does acknowledge sex is important, sex in the act of having sex, because it does provide a way for romantic couples to connect on a different, more intimate level than they would with friendship or any other kind of relationship, right? It is meaningful for, for a married couple to have that element. But his point again is that it's not everything. Sex is an element of it, but it's not the whole picture. It needs to have all the elements that he, that he alluded to as, before as well. And so this is kind of a really good way, if you notice, of him making a strong defense of why he should be able, why there should be laws that allow him to protect his ability to have a marriage, a same-sex marriage. All these elements put together, not just what his critics are saying, one element saying that's the only important thing. He wants to have a more serious, relevant issue or definition of a relationship or a marriage. Now, some may ask, well, point out, and again, why is he a good philosopher? Well, how are, you, how are you to decide what's right or wrong? And this may refer to as well, you know, some of his critics may try to approach it from a religious standpoint saying that, well, my religion says it's wrong. You know, my God says it's wrong, and that's what makes it wrong, and that's why it shouldn't be allowed. You know, others may say, well, it doesn't, you know, it's just preference, it's just made up, it doesn't really matter what's right or wrong. We each make up our own right or wrong. But again, regardless of what you think is right or wrong, those decisions, decisions of lawmakers still affect his everyday personal life. So he points out that where does morality come from? Who decides right or wrong? It's kind of an ambiguous question. Some people, like I was describing right now, may think when we talk about where does morality, where does right or wrong come from? They may think it as more of like a descriptive sense of describing, well, you know, how it was brought up or what my culture was. And that's just describing what, where I get my ideas from. But maybe on a more philosophical sense is the other where it says, where does moral truth come from? What is the truth of the matter? Is it right or wrong? That's a deeper, that's not just an opinion. He's pointing to it as a fact, but a moral fact. And he does allude, and we can get really into it as an ethics class, what we call metaethics. Metaethics is the subtle of ethics where we take a look at, well, what is the reality of right or wrong? Before we get into issues of abortion or same-sex marriage or whatever, can there be an objective right or wrong regarding the issue? And that is a deep, you know, debate that he also agrees that we should have, but we may be caught up in, in that debate and kind of lose sidetrack of, well, how are you going to determine this particular situation of same-sex marriage, right? So he points out it's actually difficult, but it's a process. It's something that we're going to 
we have to engage in? The answers are not going to come easy. And I think he's right in putting out that. This is why a lot of maybe notions of right or wrong coming from somebody's personal beliefs or something like that doesn't really help the situation. And if you point to some sort of reference or text, the Bible or whatever, and say, well, this will give me all the answers, you know, of right or wrong, and that's it. It's a very limited sort of approach because a book is fine. It has only so many pages. So it's not going to be able to cover every single thing that comes up that may be a moral issue. Say, for, say for, uh, for example, if we discuss whether AI's ability to identify faces is right or wrong, facial recognition and identifying protesters, is that a right or wrong issue? You know, should governments or companies be able to do that? Probably not a clear answer you're going to find a lot of religious texts. It was written way before AI and way before these other sort of technical advancements, right? So that's why Carvino is saying it's a process that we're going to have to work through. The answers are not going to be easy, but that doesn't mean that we can't come up with clear, logical answers to these issues. So this is why he says in it, we should be talking about this. We should be talking about these issues. We shouldn't just kind of back away and throw up our hands and say, well, it's too complicated. Teach your own. Let's just agree to disagree. The problems don't go away. The issues don't go away. And the issues and people's stances on it do affect their lives. The laws do affect their and I think that's the main takeaway for Carvino's paper. He wants you to leave you with that notion that you are obligated to engage in these type of issues, to think about these issues, and not simply avoid them and say, well, it doesn't involve me. It's not relevant to me, so I don't think about it. It's kind of a lazy way to live.